Hi, everyone. Hey. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for coming to this uh, Punks and Comics panel. Um, I'm James Spooner, and this is... Bianca Eunice. I'm Bianca. <laughs> Um, and we are uh, here with a hearty conversation about <laughs> DIY, punk rock, comics. All the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess just some like early promoting. Um, I've got my graphic novel, The High Desert, which just came out in May. Um, thank you. Um, just briefly, it's uh, about a my it's my memoir of my first year finding punk rock in eighth grade, and um, I lived in a small desert town with two or I was one of two black kids in the scene that was otherwise riddled with Nazi skins, um, and that was my like hi how you doing welcome to the scene fuck you you know, and um, so the book is really it's uh, a love letter to punk because. Uh, you know, it's a journey towards finding the beauty and magic of DIY and punk rock, which, you know, spoiler alert, I found. Here I am. Still here. <laughs> Not Still a place. Here. Still here. Um, and so that's what part of what I'll be talking about today. Bianca? Um, well, my book is called Punk Rock Karaoke. <laughs> It'll be out in 2024 with Penguin Publishing, so keep your eyes open for that. Um, it is a nonfiction, not nonfiction, it is a fiction graphic novel uh, just about being punk and being different and finding your way and looking out for people who may try to take advantage of that. So it's based off of my life, but it's a fictionalized story of that, and I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited to tell this bigger story. Um, you guys can come check out my zines. I'm at table F7 and kind of get an idea of what my storytelling is like. It's still going to be vibrant and cute and just all over the place. But I really, I really want people to open up the book and just feel like they are in a basement show the entire time. So <laughs> just, I'm so excited, but I can't, I'm not legally allowed to show you anything. So just use your imagination. Um, but yeah, I mean, just a little bit more about myself. I've been doing this, what year is it? Um, for about a little over 10 years. I've been doing comics. Um, got two of those Ignatz Awards for my comics. Um, got one of those comics upstairs, if you want to check that out, for Say Her Name, a story about police brutality, a personal experience that I had with the police. I'm from Chicago, so it was with that gang there, the CPD. Um, Let's see, what else can I rattle off about? But yeah, I just, I also am the first non-binary syndicated cartoonist. So that means that my comics are in the newspaper. So your grandparents probably have read my work. <laughs> so uh, it's under Six Chicks. I'm with part of Six Chicks. So every day of the week, a different cartoonist puts a comic in. I am part of Tuesday and I share Sunday. Um, but local papers that I do know is Boston Globe, LA Times, Toronto Star. Those are like the bigger comics that I, not the bigger comics, the bigger newspapers that I know, but I'm not sh so sure of all the little local papers that have it. Um, so feel free to search that. And if your paper doesn't have it, ask them because then I make like another dollar. So <laughs> please, please ask your newspaper to carry six chicks. Um, but that is about me. Uh, I also do work for the Nib, um, which is what the other Ignatz was for, for Be Gay Do Comics. Feel free to check that out. But I think we should probably go ahead and jump on in, because I don't want to spend too much time in intros. I want to get into, into it. Into it. So we were talking earlier, like, how should we do this? And um, I think that uh, we'd start with a reading. Mm -hmm. um, that way you can kind of have a little bit of context for uh, the work. And then we're going to, like, do some... Talking, yeah, and then we're gonna do some we're reading, maybe. All right, all right, let's get into it. Um, I have the thing. Who's first? I don't remember. Oops. It is you. Okay, so this is a um, part of my book where um, I've met another punk, this black, this other black punk, and uh, were giving me my first like punk hairdo. Previously, it was just kind of like hers, but shorter, <laughs> and not color. Okay. For generations, black folks have been filling, 
I'm sorry, have been filling in the historical omissions from public school education and deconstructing the night nightly news at barbershops and salons, all while getting countless trend, I'm sorry, I can't even read from here, while setting countless, oh, I can read here, look at this, <laughs> all while setting countless trends <laughs> and creating political statements with hair. None of this was happening at the Victor Valley Mall, that's the shitty place that I lived, um, Supercuts. So Ty and I began a weekly ritual that later connected, that I later connected to the larger black American tradition. What are you guys doing in there? Nothing, God. <laughs> Dude, your mom needs to loosen up. Tell me about it. Hey, it's totally working. Yeah, man, it's either that or a perm. <laughs> Do you, ever, do you ever worry about people thinking you're a poser, you know, because of being black? Those rednecks yelling at us on the street and, what, and stuff? What ifs? My sister took me to see Red Hot Chili Peppers a few years ago and Fishbone opened. I don't care how big they are, Fishbone blew the peppers away. Yeah? Who do you think started rock and roll? My dad used to say they're all playing Chuck Berry riffs. I never thought of that. Whatever, man, you gonna do this or what? Oops. Later, Afro. <laughs> Hells yeah, so punk. I was shocked to find that Elvis, the king, never wrote the, an original record. Some of Led Zeppelin's biggest hits were plagiarized, and the first rock and roll songs were written by a queer black woman, Rosetta, Sister Rosetta Tharp. Rock and roll. Is, black, is a black American legacy. Punk rock is black music. So this is the next day at school. The jocks and preps laughed, but now I had armor, courtesy of the underground, to combat the normals. Check that dude out, freak! They were sheep, screw them. My sights were now set on making an impression elsewhere. Oh my God, cute, you can read that. It looks really good, James. Yeah? Thanks. Come on, Romeo. I got something to show you. Dude, you think she's into me? That Hessian back there? Not a chance. But I'm glad you finally cut that Kunta bush. <laughs> Kunta bush! Ha! Wow. There are certain insults that sting to the core. That particular one might be responsible for years of masking my natural hair's texture. Don't worry, I figured it out. Oops. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I decided to pick a comic that felt like it went with James' story to kind of, since his book has just come out, I wanted to compliment that and keep the vibe going. So I'm gonna do a story about punk and hair because I feel like that's a big thing about being a punk is our hair, it's very precious to us. It's how we communicate, it's how we signal each other. Um, so let's get into it. I once had a pink wig and I truly believed it was the coolest thing in the world. I remember buying it from the novelty Halloween clearance at my local craft store, which was a joint. As someone who wasn't allowed to celebrate Halloween as a child, this purchase was extra delicious because I knew it was intended for a costume. I don't remember if the wig looked foolish on me. All I remember is that it made me feel invincible. It was like a rite of passage. Wearing it made me feel as righteous as the kids I admire in 80s movies I would binge watch alone in my room on Friday nights. Because as you can see, I was very cool in high school <laughs> and got invited to all the parties and didn't spend every day watching John Hughes movies because I'm from Chicago. <laughs> when I finally had the confidence to wear it to school, I tried to recreate the authentic 1977 punk look. Fishnets, boots, the works. Basically what I'm wearing today. My mom, a bona fide weird kid herself, even helped me cover my thrifted army jacket and safety pins and band patches. I left the house feeling like I was on top of the world. Not everyone saw it that way. At school, I was roasted. It's not like I wasn't used to being bullied. I was the district weird kid. 
I'd been anticipating the reaction, but it wasn't until I got to my science class that I started to reconsider my aesthetic choice. Look at this weirdo, ha ha. Oh, so you think you're little Kim now? Because I, I went to an African-American high school. Who do you think you're supposed to be? Halloween is over. I'm punk. Oh, that's white people shit. Those words crushed me. I felt so humiliated, embarrassed, and could feel my face get as hot as the classroom burst into a roar of laughter. <laughs> Was I denying my blackness by trying to be punk? Were there no black women like me in punk and music? As a teen, I grew up in an era pre-Google. I didn't know about polystyrene and my access was very limited to my local scene and whatever records I found at the thrift store. Bands like the Ramones look nothing like me. I never wore the wig to school again. Now that I've grown up, I realize younger me was wrong. I could be punk and black. I can be black and nearly anything. The music I choose to listen to does not give me white privilege, nor does it prevent the daily microaggressions I face as a black woman in Western society. All it does is make some people see me as the weird or perhaps cool among the tribe of black and brown weirdos I've become to know post high school. Recently, I asked if I was alternative because I grew up in an all white neighborhood. It's a common misconception that in order to be an alternative person of color, you need to grow up around white people or have internalized self-hate. I don't subscribe to either of those because I know that black people invented rock and roll. The truth is, I've learned to, be un I learned to live unapologetically. Even if that means parading around in a pink wig or singing the words to my favorite punk rock song at the top of my lungs. You make no, you make no sense. I say you, you, you make no sense at all. All right, here we go. <laughs> So though um, my uh, book came out after you put that, I did not plagiarize your story. <laughs> Talk to my lawyer. This is a common, <laughs> this is a common story. <laughs> yes, it is, yeah. Um, one that was highlighted uh, heavily in my uh, 2003 documentary, Afropunk. <laughs> um, I, uh, after reading your, um, your uh, comic the first time, was reminded of way pre-punk when I was in third grade. Um, I saw the movie Break-In, and <laughs> oh, yes. I was like, yo, mom, like, not in those words, but I was like, mom, I have to get those, like, puffy pants yeah. and like <laughs> hammer pants you know and she was like oh i can make those for you yeah so she spent the weekend like making me these like you know ozone pants uh -huh. and like i had some generic white vans i, I would like put marker on like fresh yeah. and like you know like, whatever <laughs> And like, uh, yeah, I don't remember what kind of shirt I was wearing, but it probably had some rips in it or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I wore that to school and woo, did I get roasted. Yeah. I mean, did they read it, you? I mean, it was like, oh, he's wearing his pajamas. <laughs> and, and I like stepped in a puddle and the, and the, um, the marker just like smeared. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are, we, what are we to do? I didn't wear them again. But, no. You know, yeah. It took I many feel years. Like, the, yeah, your peers kind of judging you, especially when you're like a baby weirdo, it definitely has a stronger like feeling on you. It definitely makes you kind of reconsider what you're doing. Like today, as an adult, it took me a long time to even present this way. And also like, I don't want anybody to be like, ah, if you see me read comics and I refer to myself as a woman when I wrote it, I identified as one and so, it, it makes no difference to me. If you read old comics and it says that I'm a woman and I identify as non-binary now, but I just wanted to clear that up. Um, but yeah, just like now as an adult, I feel even more free to dress this way. Um, coming up and especially growing up like on the south side of Chicago, um, my parents kind of put in me like respectability politics and to talk proper and to dress and act a certain way. Um, even though they were, they both went to art school in college, they grew out of it, I guess. They got, they got caught up in 90s evangelism um, and got <laughs> saved. 
And so I had to go through that. And I was always afraid to dress this way because I was afraid of how people would perceive me, not necessarily um, like, oh, they're punk, but this perceived me in just a totally different way. It's like black danger like white people locking their doors or being followed in the grocery store. And at the end of the day, it, didn't, it never mattered mm-hmm. what I was wearing. People would follow me at the grocery store wearing a suit. People would follow me and you know, treat me poorly just wearing like Lululemon, like it mm-hmm. didn't matter what I had on. And so it got to a point for me where I was like, well, fuck it. Like, you do that, uh, mom- you ever have that moment when you're in a store and you haven't stolen anything, but you're like walking around and like purposefully walking looking in circles, at stuff, and then you like <laughs> buy something just to prove that you haven't stolen it. There is this German grocery store by me that I always feel like I'll be looking for something. I'll be like, oh, they don't have it, and then I'll feel like, should I buy something? So they don't think I just like came in here mm-hmm. and stole something. But again, like I, I think with age, I've just sort of just been like, eh, I don't. I'd say something, like say something, but like I don't. <laughs> I don't care anymore. Even and I, I feel like a lot of y'all probably agree. After 2020, my level of caring of what other people think of me, how they perceive me, how they feel about me—it's just like I, you can't make everybody happy, and people are gonna have their preconceived ideas about you. It's just I, I'm no longer a people pleaser, um, and I think a lot of that came with me hiding my punkness is wanting to please other people mm-hmm. and wanting to be like I'm one of the good ones. And I wouldn't steal from your store, and now I'm like. Sometimes people might be stealing. Yeah, like, I, mean, I might steal from your stuff. Yeah, like, <laughs> don't, don't give, no, don't, but. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you need to eat, you need to eat. But yeah, it's just, I feel like there's that growth there that people's opinions of me no longer stop me from dressing. Like, was it for you in high school where you're just like, this, I'm no longer shaken from this versus when you were younger and doing the. the yeah, I mean, there was definitely a moment or actually the moment that's like in the book where I think it started with um I was really bullied in seventh grade like like bullied like the kind of like I'll pay you a a nickel a day to not like punch me in the stomach or whatever so um when I moved away from that school and I and I went to the this new school that I talk about in the book like I started seeing punks and I was like I think I had the misconception that people are scared of punks from like TV or something. So I was like, oh, I want to be like one of those scary punks, which only just brought more attention. But I was, you know, I was already in and I was like, I want, and I think that as one of the few black people in my uh, little scene, I really wanted to prove mm-hmm. how punk I was. So mm-hmm. I like, did, you know, I did all the superficial things you know, the bondage pants, the double mohawk, like piercings, all of the stuff to like show like, oh, I really am. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until later, like the end of high school that I like, uh, I mean, I still was, I had like bleach dreads and piercings and stuff, but I was just like way more into like zines and like I didn't, it's that, that moment where you really don't care about high school anymore or like the kids you know, it's like my, the people who I care about are like out there at shows on the weekends mm-hmm. during the week. I'm just here, you know, and nobody's going to read my zine or interested in it or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. so. Do you feel like that shifted at all when, because you grew up um, around predominantly white people, correct? At this time, but then I, I moved to New York. Spoiler alert. So do you alert. feel like that when you were around more people of color, do you feel like that changed the way you presented yourself? No, I think I was, personally, I was, I think I was looking for, when I, when I moved to New York and I started seeing black punks, I started seeing examples of what black punk looks like. Mm-hmm. So then I, uh, I wasn't, as careful to follow the like white prototype punk image. Um, and like I remember going to see a band that was like all black and they all had dreads and stuff. And I was like, and I, and everyone in the room, I could tell they all thought those guys were cooler than them, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, like I'm one of them, you know? So I like got dreads and was kind of like, 
you know, it's just, again, it's that like when you're 15, 16, whatever, it's still like I'm just still trying to like find my tribe, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, it was a, it was a, it wasn't a smooth trajectory, you know? Because at a certain point, after, after finding like a POC scene in New York, uh, but New York being like super violent hardcore, I was like, these tough guys are like, so annoying and like yeah. misogynistic and <laughs> yeah then you find the other intersectionality I was though. yeah I was not into it yeah. so then I started going out to the suburbs where like it people were like uh you know they're vegan and they're straight edge Listen, and they were like suburbs has the best weird kids I'm not gonna lie <laughs> but they they're were so all pure. white so then I was like oh man I need now I want to have those little bangs that everybody has. this is like <laughs> the 90s you know like a little caesar's cut i mean i had like i had like the full spock like yeah. the spock yeah, perm that like was like blur or something yeah yeah um you know so it was a constant ebb and flow of trying to find my tribe and i don't think it was really until uh my early 20s when i started interviewing um making afropunk and interviewing other black punks that i was really just like, oh, I don't have to do any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, this scene that I want, it doesn't exist, so I'm just gonna make it, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and you know, it it was the message that I got from punk, the DIY message of like, you know, just make your own shows, make your own zines. I was like, I'm gonna make my own scene, you Mm -hmm. know? And being able to, to do that by, you know, by, finding these different punks and then uh, and then just also just inviting black people who are just on the fringe and being like, you guys are open-minded. Right. Like, ch- come check out this hardcore band. And, uh, you know, for a minute there, we had something. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like sometimes with trying to nail the right look, sometimes you get into this realm of, like, the commodification of punk mm-hmm. and, like, having to nail all the right things it kind of removes what punk was about in the first place which was like this strong sense of not necessarily individualism where we aren't a community but where you can express who you are and we're all welcome in this space as different people but we're going to build this community together and we're going to respect our differences Mm -hmm. when it gets when it kind of got pulled into the hot topic world and like the just this machine that's like, oh, you gotta have all the you know the Instagram ads of how you're supposed to dress. Like, I feel like we've lost something there. Well, yeah, um, I think it ebbs and flows because yeah. you know when I when I think about the beginnings, like you know going all the way back to Iggy Pop or something, right? Like they're all just kind of like, I don't know what we're supposed to do, just right. a leather jacket, you know? Like that's wild, and then. Um, and then, like, you go to Europe, and it's like they have like the fashion. This is what you're supposed to look like, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like this commercialization. But mm-hmm. then uh, everything is reacting. So then in uh, the United States, they're like, "Fuck that shit!" And everyone's just like shaving their head, and like, "We're gonna do this hardcore thing," you know? And I have an ad from 1982 that's. Uh, from J.C. Penney's, and it says like <laughs> uh, "Punk Summer," and oh it's and it's like you know, <laughs> it's it's like a it's like a triangle that's like you know neon or something you know. It's just like there's a constant like you could go through and yeah. find it. You know, it's like uh, green. It, the the thing that I've learned over the years is that like, okay, we're in the underground. We like have all this shit to say about the mainstream, right? Mm-hmm. The mainstream is looking to us for inspiration. They take our shit, and then we have to come up with new shit. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's just a circular thing. And we, if we didn't have something to say fuck you to, yeah, then we wouldn't even be a thing. Yeah, you know. And I see that here in like, this is my uh, first go at uh, comics, my first book, my first round of conventions but even when i just was coming as a spectator i was like this feels really punk Mm -hmm. you know like this this look this feels like the the biggest distro table right you know like there's no band but i like you know i kind of like the distro table sometimes better than what's happening on stage you know so um 
I think we got it. I think we understand that here. At least in this room. Yeah. I don't know what those people are doing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I agree. I feel like everybody's work is definitely, especially like the independent artists, are, they're trying to say something, they're trying to use their voice. Like, I always felt like my comics is my music mm -hmm. because um, I, I can't, like, I have tons of instruments that I, like, can't play. And so, like, I've always had aspirations to be a musician, but I, like, I just, it's just not... It's not what I was destined to do. Comics is, I feel like I have that flow with it. And one of my really good friends, um, who's in a comic that we may read today, um, I she's think in I a saw band. her in that last panel. Yeah, she was also in that last <laughs> panel. Um, one of my besties. And she's in this post punk band called Ganser. She plays the bass. And she's also like a really big comics nerd. Like, I felt like a lot of people on the punk scene are also like comics nerds or they were anime nerds at some point, And then we, like made it here, mm -hmm. um, or I also feel like goths become anime nerds, or anime nerds become goths, and like comics become. But there's some there's some overlap. There's I, definitely some overlap. I was definitely in the I was a weeb. I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> Love that Sailor Moon and Fushigi Yugi and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I just feel like it's there's always something to talk about. Like even in the scene now, like you were saying, like there's always something to give a F you about. I feel like there's been a lot of, there's been a, a, a collective consciousness and awakening that we've been having of this kind of recognizing some of our idols aren't as great as we had once imagined. Um, and they are, they are human beings, they're imperfect, but um, saying that there is an importance for these voices, like there's an importance for our voice too. Cause looking back, as I said in my comic, even though I fully understand that there were people who looked like me that existed in the 70s, even like with the, the mods of the 60s and before then, um, they were never recorded. Um, it was, it's even been a problem within the comic scene that I see that we're actively trying to work against is the circle of white friends who kind of invite their white friends and then they invite their white friends, and then all that's recorded in history is what the white guys did. Even though there were other people, like we just found out about, if you weren't from like the Pacific Northwest, you probably didn't know about Bam Bam, who, per, who was before Nirvana, who Kurt Cobain was a roadie for and learned about grunge through her. It was a black woman who had blonde hair like this and pretty much invented the grunge sound, but without recording and holding that information precious, it kind of got lost. And so I feel like that's kind of our work today is to constantly be putting that information out here that we are here, that we exist, because the commodification of it is always going to be like this cleaned up white version of it versus what actually is here. I mean, looking out into this audience of people, I see so many different types of people, but we're all brought together over this same belief like it's it's like church without you know getting churchy but it's like <laughs> it's beautiful it's a, again it's a community and I think it's important that we continue to do that that we continue to lift up our voices lift up our voices and sing. Oh, I'm not gonna sing the black national anthem right now but I mean we could sing a song um, yeah I think that's really important um, because we don't want everything in our history, everything that we're known for to be these abusers or, I mean, pedophiles. There's a lot of those in the music industry. I don't know what that's about. Like, you even brought up Led Zeppelin. Oh, yeah. Kidnap a teenage girl. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to have diverse voices and work. Um, yeah, I mean, like, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about certain pivots or temples of people kind of turning out to be not so savory. Well, I'm actually, uh, I just wrote this like um, chapter for a new, a new book that I'm working on and it's uh, dealing with the emotional labor of that people of color have to do thinking about these bands and whether or not they are racist. What do they mean by that? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, it can be, uh, especially with punk, and especially like with early punk, it could be something as like seemingly benign and, uh, you know, fully willing to give the benefit of the doubt of like guilty of being white um, by minor threat, 
or it can be like allied end bombs like uh los angeles by x yeah. um dead kennedys have a couple of choice christian, uh, christian death, has christian one. death. Yeah. i don't even know if they're allied or not but <laughs> it's a damn good song um and uh y- you know and then there's like these bands like the meat men who everyone gives a pass to or you know someone like Gigi Allen, who like people are like, eh, but then if you do like them, it's like, eh, it's kind of edgy, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there's all of these things that I grew up with where it's just like, uh, even extreme stuff like, like M.O.D., where it's just like, dude, he's saying like, let the niggers die, you know? And it's like, oh, but it's, it's sarcastic. It's a joke, you know? Mm-hmm. Like lighten up, you know? And uh, always having to do that emotional labor is really tough, you know? Just a couple days ago, I posted on Instagram, uh, I was reading this article from 1978 uh, um, that was in the Village Voice, and they're talking about racism in the punk scene. And uh, there's just this god-awful quote from uh, Nico, (laughs) uh, Nico Icon. I mean, it's just like, wow, there's no... Yeah, there's just no mixing words. Like, she's just straight up racist, like, calling black people's features like animals, you know? And called us monkeys. Yeah, and it's just like, um, like, how many times have I gone to, like, some post-punk party and they're playing, like, a Nico song or whatever? She stabbed a black woman in the eye. I just, just FYI, Nico is not a good person. Yeah, so it's tough because, you know, it's that, like, you know, we're living in this like cancel culture kind of thing. And some of these people are dead. Some of these people have, you know, this was like 30, 40 years ago. They have grown, they've apologized. You know, like I, I give, I'm okay with the descendants and their like homophobia because they have apologized and they don't play those songs. And they're mm-hmm. like, look, like I was alive in the 80s. I remember it was just very common to just call something gay if it was whack. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that people didn't know better because there was always people who knew better, um, but I will believe that they were 16, 17, 18 year old white uh, idiots, and they see that now, yeah. and they're like, we don't even play that song because we don't want people singing that song, right? You know? Yeah. So it's like, I uh, I believe. You know, it's kind of, I don't know if it's like an abolitionist kind of way of thinking about it, but it's like people make mistakes. There is so much shit that like, if there was Instagram or something when I was 14 or 15, it's like, but we grow, hopefully, you know? Um, But meanwhile, like, you know, Scott Ian from Anthrax was like still playing SOD songs. So I'm like, yeah, I don't think you grew, so no. fuck you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I feel like everybody deserves that space to grow. I think sometimes we um, kind of try to turn people into martyrs or into saints, where they have to walk this path of everything, every decision that you made was perfect when the society that we grew up in in this country um, is actively homophobic, is actively racist, is actively sexist and transphobic and all of these things. And so we all have to constantly do the work to decolonize our minds and to decolonize these thoughts and these beliefs. Like I grew up in the church, so even though like we were sneaking off and like, you know, jamming behind the church, like it was still we still had our beliefs and I still like married Jesus in a purity ball and things like that. And we're like, oh, you know, only butt stuff, you know, like <laughs> still trying to, you know, uphold God. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of fascism in the American Christian church. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, sugarcoat that uh, because I see some of that's, I'm like, I'm, gl- I'm glad nobody saw my diaries from when I was younger. Cause mm-hmm. like, I didn't know any better. Cause I was just spitting out what I was taught, which is a lot of those kids, like the descendants, they were just spitting out what they were taught. Totally. Um, and when your whole community agrees with you and are like, yes, this is what's up, then you think this is, this is right. And when you're constantly being rewarded for these ideas, you think you're doing the right thing. Um, so yeah, I think we all deserve that space. I think that's how we're going to evolve as a species, is to give each other that, that space to grow, but also just because you give somebody that space doesn't necessarily mean you still have to 
you don't have to vibe with them anymore. You don't have to support them or give them money. Be like, I oh, listen, you made that mistake. Like, especially was like more like physical and sexual abuse and things like that. I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're doing the work, but um, I'm just gonna, we're gonna keep a distance. Um, and that's, that's, those are called consequences. Yeah. So people true. have to live through consequences. I know they were like, oh, they're canceled. No, they're just experiencing consequences for their action. For every action, there is a equal reaction. So Hopefully. that's just life <laughs> um, in general. But again, that's why I think it's really important that you know the work that we save and the work that we put out into the world is giving diverse voices, is putting out different opinions. Because again, when all the people are at the top, you know, is what we decide is like the cream of the crop. A lot of times those dudes are abusers. How do you think they got there? How do you think they, they became this, this gang, basically, of all, you'll only see this work. Mm -hmm. You will only know of this. Um, it's important for everybody to have their shot to say the word. Like, even people come to me and they're like, oh, Bianca, like, what if there's another, you know, punk non-binary cartoonist that puts their work out there? I'm like, great, Jesus, I hate being like the only person up here. Like, it's... <laughs> I want to see other people's stories. We're all, we all have unique stories to tell, um, even though, again, like our hair story, similar, but like still so different. It's still important for someone to read that and be like, who's, ha who's going through a similar thing and be like, wow, like, okay, cool, I'm going to shake cannot, my head or Yeah, you cannot in. have enough uh, representation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Also, like, it's not like, um, oh, I make a, I make a book. So uh, now everyone is covered, you know? It's like, you're gonna do it and, you know, it's an, sometimes it's generational, sometimes mm -hmm. it's regional, sometimes people are gonna like, I wanna read, I wanna read this from the perspective of a non-binary person or I wanna read it with like bubbly cartoons um, <laughs> versus more realistic ones, you know? Like, so the more the merrier. Yeah, and, I, and yeah, again, just like, when it comes to white guys, you how many versions of the same thing can you find? Like it's just it's all that's out there. Like how many how many movies are out there of just like this older white dude that's like I need to find my way, and then some bubbly woman shows up and shows him the way. You know, like there's like a thousand of those, and I I was all about those when I was a teenager, and then dated older people because that was dumb. Um, but it was just like yeah, like. There, I always tell myself, and I always tell this to my students too, like don't be afraid that like, oh, my idea has to be original and it has to be the only one of its kind. Just tell your story because like, yeah, white dudes don't care. The deepest, I feel like for the cartoonists in the room or storytellers, like just if you can be vulnerable, if you can like uh, not, like whatever it is that scares you the most, if you can tell that story, those are the, that's what's going to make people pay attention because and not even to pay attention to you, but they see themselves, mm -hmm. you know? And I tell this to my daughter all the time cause she's 13 and she's like, what am I going to be when I like, you know? And I'm like, you don't know yet. It's fine. But I keep telling her like as a, as an artist, um, if you're willing to like, think about your favorite song, think about your favorite painting, think about your favorite book, like in every one of those cases, they're saying something that you were not able to say, you know? So you're like moved emotionally because they had lyrics, put it in a picture, whatever it is, and it's like, holy shit, they said, I've always felt that way, I've never had the words, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that only comes from just being like raw and allowing yourself, everyone to see you for who's really there, um, which is not easy. But the reward is, um, is infinite. I mean, that's what we're here as artists, you know? I definitely had a time period where I made art that was really cool looking, but didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And it didn't connect with anybody. It was just like, oh, that's cool looking, you know? Um, it wasn't until I was like, all right, what, is my, what am I really in pain about? And yeah. did that work? That generations literally are like still... Uh, what do you call it, like, the repercussions, I can see them. The ripple effect is like, holy shit, that movie you made 20 years ago is, like, still yeah. doing something, you know? Yeah. Should we uh, 
maybe read another section? Sure. I don't think we have, um, I don't, what's the time? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, I wanted to say real quick, um, just going off of that, I, I, you know, I get some emails and DMs and messages all the time about my work and people connecting to it, but I'll never forget I got this email from this older black woman who told me my work felt like an exhale for her. Mm -hmm. And like just hearing that from me, I was like, thank you, auntie. Like I was like, that that meant, I almost, that probably almost meant more for me than it did for her to be recognized by my elders. Like I think, you know, again, like just sharing that work it's not even just like us as artists, us as, as human beings, yeah. is to have that moment of vulnerability with each other and to, to see each other and to be like, you were, you were here with me in this space and we are having all of these feelings, we are sharing these feelings, like despite um, whatever boxes we check, um, these human experiences are all the same. And I think that's beautiful. Like even though we are both up here as black people, um, you know, there is a crowd of people who connect with our work, despite the fact that they may not share share the melanin. Sorry, um, <laughs> it's still about these human experiences, and I think that's what's beautiful about our work. Yeah, once you get to, I think once you get to know anybody, there's a place to connect. I mean, um, even in my book, there are, are Nazis who are not villains like they're like you read them and you're like oh I kind of feel bad for them you know because it's like there's a reason you know that once you get to know the backstory it's like oh shit like you know and it's like eh, it's a kid maybe he'll get <laughs> maybe he'll oh, turn around maybe he'll get saved <laughs> let me uh we got like 10 minutes sure to this. Uh, oh you first oh me all right, so this is a little comic that I did for, um, I also work for Riot Fest, which is a, a music magazine, but also there's a festival in Chicago that I miss to come here. So you should thank me later that I'm missing all of these bands that I really like. Um, so this one is Tales of the Cemetery with my friend that I mentioned before, Ganser. To continue my search for the most horrifying tale with some of the best punk has to offer, I got to sit down in the cemetery with Ganser's Alicia Gaines. She regaled me on some of her most bone-chilling incidents. And this is from Alicia's perspective. Growing up, I never felt like I had the space to be spontaneous or free-spirited. As a child, my father would tell me I would have to work twice as hard to get half as far. I couldn't tell you how many times I've been labeled as intense. When I'm on tour with my band Ganser, that's another story. Punk has given me a space to feel free. I am impulsive, I let loose, but there will always be reminders that I am a black biracial woman, especially in the United States. Tell me about it. One time while driving through Ohio, notoriously known among bands for being a speed trap, and I think amongst anybody knows that Ohio is just <laughs> a shit show. We got pulled over by a cop in an unmarked SUV. That's terrifying. Reflexively, I went into pulled over while black mode. I looked over out my window, making myself as innocuous as possible. Charlie, our guitarist, wasn't as concerned. How fast can I go, officer? <laughs> we were lucky we, got, we only got a ticket, but as history has shown, that's not always the case. There is no green book for black musicians. I remember once, Waking up in the back seat of the tour van in Alabama, groggily taking in gas station lined with different iterations of Confederate flags. There was no rest stop for miles, and as a band that also has two Jewish members and multiple queer folk, we would approach the gas station with caution. The political opinions of the gas station owners were clear. Confederate flags adorned the walls pinned like butterflies, while a large portrait of the 45th governor of Alabama and noted segregationist George Wallace hung besides them. Nadia found homophobic pamphlets in the bathroom. Pray it away. The most egregious of it all was a small pastel painted wood sign that says, rules for living, rule one, love thy neighbor. <laughs> After processing that moment of cognitive dissonance, it was time to leave. So what's scarier, driving through the backwoods of Americana or moonlit cemetery picnics? Definitely touring. With cemeteries, all the racists are already dead. <laughs> And 
And then uh, after I read uh, this one, I was like, I too have a cemetery story. <laughs> so uh, just a little bit of background. Um, I was hanging out, uh, I just finished hanging out at uh, Nazi Skin's house who had uh, befriended me and gave me, um, smoked me out for the first time. And I was like, oh, he likes me. So uh, we, we were going to the cemetery and I had this fear that maybe uh, there was something else going to happen. Um, so what's with all that stupid white power crap? Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, if he's like, he's like that, why is he hanging out with us? Shoot, man, we've been friends since preschool. Our moms used to work together in junk. It's his dumbass brother. Even that dude ain't legit. When, when him and my sister were in high school, he was totally whipped. He used to follow her around like a lost puppy. Now he's all white power. Even as a, I was like, screw it, they ain't talking about us anyway. Even as adults, experiencing prejudice is unavoidable. We can't hide from the racist coworkers, customers, business owners, elected officials, and so on. We have always had to make the choice around when to speak up and when to bite our tongues. Though, pe though part of me feared this was an elaborate prank ending with, a, with my corpse being dumped in the desert, I stayed quiet the rest of the ride. It hadn't occurred to me that most people don't have to contemplate the potential for homicide in new friendships. Come on, I got something to show you. That's the 14-year-old Nazi. I didn't know where he was taking me. I would have felt safer staying close to the rest of the gang. Say cheese. All right, you little bastard. I got you right where I want you. Damn, strike three. That wasn't even close. Shut up. With, with my life no longer in jeopardy, I had time to focus on more pressing matters. This girl over here. <laughs> Give the camera real drama. Stop <laughs> making me laugh. <laughs> so what's up with the chicks? I don't know. There is this Chinese girl I'm talking to, but I'm starting to like someone else, too. I say who go forever is going to give it up. But seriously, I hear chinks are tight. Cringy, I know. In my early teens, I wasn't emotionally mature enough to stand up for myself, much less someone else. I wouldn't be a cap capable of unpacking the intersectionality of sexism and racism for many more years to come. Flap! Woohoo! Home run! Give it back. Let me try to redeem myself. Later. Isn't your mom going to notice the truck is gone? We stole her mom's truck. <laughs> uh, nah, she passed out for the night. Started early, huh? Sounds familiar. Shut up. Yeah, leave her alone. It's OK. My family's jacked. Mine too, sometimes. I mean, I love them, but I don't know. It's hard to, you know, look after Mikey all the time. I'm his sister, not his mom. She has a handicapped twin brother. Um, yay. Yeah, after my dad died, I feel like my mom wanted me to be the man of the house or whatever. I never even cried for him. Is that messed up? I don't think so. I mean, I didn't cry when I saw my dad beat up my mom. Shit, I know all about that. Parents. Yeah, parents. Parents, why don't they shut up? <laughs> parents, they're so fucked up. <laughs> All right. So I think that we um, may not have time for Q&A, do we? No, we got to wrap. Um, but we are here, so you know you can come talk to us. Yeah, yeah, I'll be here all weekend. My t again, my table is five seven, so it's all the way in the back. F seven. Uh, oh yeah, five seven. I said F seven. Thank you. Yeah. Five. I'm gonna say it again now. Now it's stuck. 
F7. And uh, yeah, come see me. I got comics, and I'm always willing to chat it up. Yeah, and I'm at uh, J4. I'm right by Silver Sprocket. Um, I have some books here, too, if you guys want to buy them directly. Uh, and uh, otherwise, you can get them at the table. So thanks so much for coming and hearing us. <laughs> <laughs>